Um, I'm going to talk about bacteria because that's one of my major obsessions. Um, and to me, plague is the most sublime bacteria. Um, and this is actually my hand holding a petri dish of plague. I was able to enter a lab and actually be trained in how to work with these kind of organisms. Um, and it's quite a journey, obviously, from just being an artist, maybe doing a degree in painting, which is what I did, to getting into kind of very high secure labs and things like that to work with the scientists. And obviously, it's taken a lot of kind of building of trust and, and things like that. Um, bacteria are fascinating, though. I'm completely obsessed with them. Um, did you know there are more bacteria on the end of your finger than there are people in the world? <laughs> even if you've washed your hands. Um, <laughs> actually, they grow faster if you wash your hands. Um, <laughs> and at the heart of every cell in your body is something called a mitochondrion, which is, for all intents and purposes, it's an archaea bacteria that formed a symbiotic relationship with human cells at an early evolutionary stage. So if it wasn't for these organisms, we wouldn't even exist. Um, also, there are 10 times more bacterial cells in the human body than there are human cells. So, if you think about it that way, we're superorganisms. And all those bacterial cells are able to communicate with each other and do all sorts of strange and fascinating behaviour. Obviously, like plague, they might want to kill us. Um, well, they don't want to. Um, it's just a byproduct of them spreading themselves, which is what they want to do. Um, or they might live kind of symbiotically with us, be an integral part of our immune system, like the gut bacteria are. Or they might just be there, doing their thing. We tend to, we know about looking at the metagenome of kind of soil or something like that. We know about 1% of bacteria in the world, they've been studied. Typically, you only see about 300 different types of bacteria in a clinical microbiology lab. So, actually, that's a really tiny amount of the bacteria that surround us. But, I mean, one of the most famous ones is, is, is MRSA, or MRSA, as they call it in America. Um, and people are terrified of this particular superbug and these other kind of emerging hospital pathogens, um, which... They tend to affect people who've got weak immune systems, who've recently had an operation or something like that. So they tend to focus in hospitals. It's not to do with 30 hospitals or anything like that. In fact, new research is revealing it's very different to that, actually. Um, they said about MRSA, it may be the new HIV. Um, potentially deadly superbug was found in British milk for the first time. So you might be frightened, you might be drinking milk, because this would be unpasteurised milk or unpasteurised cheese. Um, but then it wouldn't necessarily hurt you, um, because you aren't immune compromised, you're not sick and ill in a hospital situation. And actually, it's a normal part of our, of our body. Um, We've, you know, there's talk about how the hospitals actually unleash this MRSA, or is it to do with antibiotic misuse? There's talk about that. I'll go on to it. Um, I mentioned the bacteria can communicate with each other. They're sending chemical signals to each other. They use um, hormones, for instance, so, such as homoserine lactone. And I made a project where I actually used bacteria in the process of communicating. So I worked with a genetically modified strain of, um, you can see on this, on this piece here, there's a purple bacterium, which is Chromobacterium violaceum. It turns purple when it communicates, when it's sending a communication signal. So if you had one bacterium on its own in a Petri dish, it would be white. If you put a few of them together, they turn purple. And they do this um, because they're signalling to each other that they have, um, basically there's enough of them around to turn on certain things that they do, such as uh, virulence factors, toxin production, or something like that. It's all to do with numbers um, with bacteria, numbers and location, pretty much. But like I said, there's more bacteria on the end of your finger than there are people in the world. Um, so there's quite a lot there. Um, I used a genetically modified strain of CV026, which turned purple um, when it was placed near the, CV, the chromobacterium violaceum. So you were able to actually watch 
in the artwork, you're able to actually watch bacterial communication taking place before your eyes. Um, this is being investigated as a potentially new form of antibiotic, because if you can interrupt the communication of bacteria, if you can change, um, the, if you can kind of disable the receptors for it, then you can do things like stopping them knowing how many other bacteria there are around, which means that you can stop them producing the toxins that make you seriously ill. You might even be able to tell them to go into a spore state or a dormant state so they don't make people ill and they don't have those activities. So it's fascinating, this new research. Um, this is actually the Staphylococcus aureus that lives in my nose. <laughs> I'm actually quite pleased to say I have two different stain, strains of Staphylococcus aureus in my nose, one in each nostril. Um, unfortunately, I don't have MRSA. I was quite disappointed about that when I found out. But at least 30% of the population have Staphylococcus aureus living in their nose or other parts of their body. Um, it's normal skin flora. MRSA is, or MRSA, is methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's a strain of this thing that lives in my nose or in your nose um, that's developed drug resistance to a certain group of antibiotics. And that makes it interesting and difficult to cope with and quite problematic. Um, to communicate this work, um, because I've been working on a project, I'm artist in residence at Oxford University with a project called Modernising Medical Microbiology. It's got different bases. There's a base in Brighton, a base in Birmingham as well. And Brighton um, used to have quite high levels of MRSA um, in the hospital here. And this, it turned out to be, because on the Modernising Medical Microbiology project, they're studying... Um, whole genome sequencing of bacteria. So you have this thing, you know they did the human genome project and we've got all this information about how the human genome works. Um, bacterial genomes are much shorter, so you can actually sequence a bacterial genome in less than a day and the price is now coming right down. So in the next five to ten years, um, when you go and have a sort of test, it won't be, you know, we're going to give you some antibiotics that we think might make you better. Um, and then we'll try something else if that doesn't work. It may be possible they'll be able to sequence um, the genome of the bacterial infection. It will tell you exactly what drug resistances it has and exactly what strain you're suffering from of what bacteria it is. So it's going to be, it's going to really revolutionise uh, microbiology. This is um, a picture of my MRSA quilt in its early stages. Um, basically I've been embedding textiles into Petri dishes. This is using an MRSA um, chromogenic agar which turns blue when MRSA is present. So we embedded textiles and we made things like polka dots out of vancomycin susceptibility discs and each of the quilt squares is made from different tools and techniques in the treatment and diagnosis of MRSA and that's what the finished work looked like. We developed a bit of a new technique, we autoclaved the squares uh, before we stitched the quilt together um, which means we high pressure, high steam pressure um, cooked it uh, basically in the same technique as you use for uh, sterilising operating theatre equipment. So now this piece is kind of a storytelling quilt, I guess, like in the tradition of, of the American storytelling quilts. It's actually on show in America at the moment. Um, and each square reveals a different tool or technique in the treatment and diagnosis of MRSA. So it's a fantastic way that members of the public can come and they can talk to me and they can also talk to the scientists I work with and ask questions. And it has a way of allowing people into the story. We also do workshops where people can come and sit with us and and make their own MRSA quilt pieces which will then be incorporated into the piece and we've also had people who've suffered from MRSA infections come along and participate in those and kind of really put their kind of story into the into the squares which has been amazing that didn't work right um, I'm currently working with another area of um, research, which is tuberculosis, which I'm probably going to shock you. Um, a third of the world's population are currently infected with TB a third of the world's population, um, and it's the world's largest infectious killer. It kills 2 million a year. Only 10% of people who are infected with TB get sick from it. So it's having this kind of huge effect on humanity that we don't know about. And it's the earliest known um, disease in man. It's been found in Neolithic bones. Um, they used to think it was caused by a demon dog entering the body of the person and then barking from within. Um, this is 
quote, where there is dust there is danger, is from a 1902 copy of the London News, and it's the advice of the um, British Society for the Prevention of Consumption. Where there is dust, there is danger. Avoid dust. They used to think in 1902 that the main primary cause of tuberculosis was dust. Um, this seems quite strange nowadays. But what I'm so fascinated in is kind of looking at this historical stuff and unpacking these historical um, stories and then bringing it right up to date with... Um, it's quite slow, this. With um, kind of... Where are we now? Looking at the whole genome sequencing work and things like that. I quite enjoy taking the kind of historical research of the pioneers of microbiology, people like Pasteur, Sergei Vinogradsky and Robert Koch, and teaching people in all sorts of areas in how to do their own do-it-yourself microbiology techniques. So getting down, culturing bacteria and doing this using commonly available supplies in all sorts of settings. So I did a workshop last year in Cairo, um, which is a very difficult kind of challenging environment to do it. But I develop the protocols with scientists over here and then work with microbiologists over there to do it absolutely safely. Um, recently, last two weeks, I did a workshop at Genspace in New York working with artists there and kind of sharing that knowledge further. Um, artists in labs, are we dangerous? Um, Trust Me, I'm an Artist. I did a project called Trust Me, I'm an Artist where we, we got artists to present their work in front of uh, basically ethics committees um, in front of an audience and the artist would present the work, the ethics committee would debate the work without the artist present as if they were you know, doing a research ethics approval of the work and then the artist was brought back in and then at the end the artist and the audience would have a right to reply as to whatever the view was. We had Neil White present his work at one of the events. He, uh, he invited people to take to choose whether to self-experiment by taking a, a pill of um, methylene blue, um, which will turn your pea blue, um, the hypothesis is, in a, in a kind of reenactment of Eve Klein's um, famous experiment. So we had a wonderful debate about the nature of self-experimentation in science and how it's written out of kind of the way um, papers are published. You're not really allowed to say if you self-experiment in an artwork. Another kind of interesting piece of self-experimentation which caused a lot of debate was um, our Oriente Objets work, May the Horse Live Within Me, which was debated at our event at the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris, where Marion um, had a blood transfusion from horse, of, of horse blood and created a performance around this. Um, sounds very shocking. She worked with scientists over a period of time um, to prepare her immune system. It's a very, very complex project to do, but she did actually achieve it. And we were debating, you know, what are the ethical attitudes to this? Because one of the things artists can do is really raise those kind of questions, I think, um, in science settings. And we can talk about ethical issues that, that are maybe being kind of ignored or need to reach the public in different ways. This is a quote from Dr. John Paul that I work with. We're in the midst of a quiet revolution and it's going to have as big an impact on our lives as the industrial revolution had on our ancestors' lives. This is whole genome sequencing. It's absolutely going to revolutionise how um, clinical medicine is done in, in, in the next sort of 10 to 15 years. So we need to kind of think about this now. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for us in terms of privacy issues, access to medicine, levels of health care, um, all those sorts of things. So kind of just to wind up, let's get more artists in labs, I think, because we can, we can go in there. We, we do play. We play about. We ask all sorts of weird questions. I'm always saying things, why did that happen? And they always get, ooh, well, I don't really know. And that's quite interesting because it can trigger off new kind of areas of research. But one of the most important things is that we can reach out to wide audiences that are the different, the non-science audiences, not the ones that they would typically get to with a science journal or something like that. I can do projects, my patchwork quilt. Little old ladies love embroidery and things. They love the quilts. It's bizarre. And they are fascinated and they've got all the questions. Why can't, why am I so frightened to go into hospital? And they can ask me and I can be a conduit um, 
to the scientists and sometimes they will work at the events with me as well. So it's a fantastic way of reaching the public who really have got a right to participate in this new research and participate in the debate. So get more artists in labs. <laughs>